Attention chiropractors, slayers of subluxation, unleashers of the imprisoned impulse. I am Dr. Anthony Pellegrino from ChiroEdge, and welcome to this week's episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown, where each week we break down the most relevant chiropractic science and philosophy to empower you with the ammo and certainty necessary to change your community from the inside out. All right, good morning, chiropractors, slayers of subluxation, and leashers of the imprisoned impulse. Welcome to another episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. I know it's been a couple minutes, but I'm excited to be back with you with you guys today. I'm with Dr. John Chung. We're going to break down um, chiropractic research and science to give you the ammo and certainty necessary to change the healthier community from the inside out. So, like I said, I am here with Dr. John Chung, who, if you guys look into anything chiropractic and concussion, you have probably seen him, seen his work, and I hope you're on his mailing list. So he owns Keystone Chiropractic and Neuroplasticity. We were just talking, we added the Neuroplasticity a couple months ago because of the functional neuro work that you've been doing um, with some of your patients and practice members down there. Um, as well as, guys, right now, if you have a second, jump on protecttheneck.com, which is his technical blog and mailing list. And this is where I get a lot of good information. And actually, um, we've done whole articles for ChiroEdge based off of just the stuff that he's kind of broken down for the chiropractor. Uh, and it's just really, really good. We've, I've learned a lot from, from him on that. So, Dr. Chung, first off, Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm super excited to have you on. Thanks, Anthony. I've been uh, following your uh, your page and stuff like that for a while, so I appreciate the stuff you're doing for the chiropractors. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Now, we're going to jump into the science and the research, but on a personal level, Avi, for you to go this deep into concussion and TBI and just your understanding of it, um, what made you like really begin to focus on on this in your practice? So it all started with a couple of patients that I was seeing. Um, the first patient I saw was a football player. He just graduated high school, but he was suffering with, uh, he came to us specifically for hip pain, but a lot of his biggest, most obvious complaints were a lot of mental health issues. He was dealing with unexplained depression. He was dealing with um, some headache symptoms, brain fog. He just wasn't what you would want a 19-year-old kid to be. He had a history of playing football. And we started taking care of him just from a chiropractic upper cervical standpoint. And one of the interesting things that happens when you practice chiropractic is it's sometimes not the person's chief complaint that get, goes away first, right? It's a lot of times some of the other comorbid things that change first. And for him, like his mood improved much more rapidly than his hip pain. So a lot of these brain-based issues seem to be the things that resolve the most quickly for this specific patient, which was really neat. Eventually, his hip pain got better, but just seeing this kid's transformation from being a depressed kid that was at the center of this football issue where he's an offensive lineman, he's a big dude. For most of his life, he was a pretty happy kid, but after his years of playing high school football, he just kind of started becoming depressed out of nowhere. So that was the first patient that we took care of. I was like, wow, that was really, really neat because people don't associate chiropractic with mental health, even though you know physical health and mental health are inextricably linked together, especially when you look at it through the brain. Now, the other patient, and this is where I started going down the rabbit hole with concussion, I was taking care of an equestrian. And this was part of my case study that I recently published in the Journal of Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research. It's a young girl. She was 16 years old, a really competitive rider. So she was doing horse jumping and dressage. Actually, no, she was jump, doing dressage for sure. So dressage is basically horse dancing. And when you're an equestrian, statistics show that about 25% of serious equestrians where they're doing things competitively are going to fall off and hit a horse and hit their head at some point. So this young girl, super competitive equestrian, came down from New Jersey and he's here in Wellington to spend the entire horse season with us. But the opening parts of horse season, she falls off, hits her head. She hasn't been able to ride in three months prior to seeing us. And within about two weeks after seeing us, her symptoms of headache and dizziness started going away when she wasn't subluxated. And every time that we adjusted her and within 
a few weeks, she was actually back to competitive writing again. And when you work with a niche community like the equestrian community, things start to kind of roll pretty quickly. We started getting a lot of referrals from people that had these head injuries. And we were seeing that consistently by doing really good, accurate work at that upper cervical um, spine, that cranial cervical junction, that a lot of these patients with persistent concussive symptoms are getting better relatively quickly within a matter of weeks. And that's where we started to go really, really deep into a lot of this work involving concussions and it's especially the impact that the neck has on concussion symptoms. You said 25% of like hardcore equestrians have a head injury, 25%? Yeah, so there's not that much on them right now, but they're estimating anywhere between 24 and 25% of serious equestrians will have fallen off their horse and hit their head at some point in their life. That's amazing. Now, I kind of put equestrian into my big four, which is if I have a, a, a random onset of sciatica in a 29 to 32 year old woman, I ask, were you a cheerleader, a dancer, a gymnast or an equestrian? And it's yeah, always one of those four, always one <laughs> of those four. And now it, taking that knowledge and that knowing to ask those questions now is just it's I mean, like we're still going to correct the subluxation regardless, you know, but it's just so important to be able to recognize and relate to if you have a 30 year old with a concept of sciatica, well, let's start asking those other questions. Let's look at some of those uh, those longstanding unresolved issues from a possible head, head injury or concussion. Yeah, and especially from a concussion, and you just have those repetitive micro traumas that we talked about for years. Like there's legitimacy towards having those things come up. And we know now that, especially in football, it's like, a lot of these brain injury problems aren't necessarily like people suffering big hits. It's when they're hitting, getting these sub concussive hits over and over again, that seem to be a big problem for many of these players. Yeah, there's a whole thing with CTE, right? Or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's not that big, that big, big, big injury. Um, but the repetitive small, I mean, they're not smaller because if you're in NFL, <laughs> your smaller hit is still at 20 miles an hour, you know? But Yeah, exactly. So we're seeing that these repetitive issues, even if they're not getting to the point where it becomes catastrophic, like a concussion, might even be worse for people because if you're getting these sub-concussive impacts, you're not necessarily taking yourself out of the game when you probably should because you're like, okay, I can shake my head off, I can get back into this, and I feel fine, but feeling is not necessarily the function. If you're feeling fine, but your performance is 20 25% less, then all of a sudden you're going to be subject to a potentially worse hit later down the line, or you just continue to take these head impacts without actually doing something about it, which more and more studies now are starting to show that early intervention with some of these cases might be helpful for many of these patients. Okay, so there's a couple of things we went through there. I want to stay, just go through, we're going to talk, I want to talk about what early intervention, what that actually looks like. But before we get into that, and I'm making a note for myself, so I don't forget to circle back to that. One of the things that we had spoken about was some of those like long-standing effects, and as a chiropractor, what to look out for or recognize. Um, we mentioned like like brain fog. What other stuff should we be looking out for? Let's say we have somebody who's an ex-football player, an ex-equestrian, uh, a uh, race car driver, something, and we know, hey, there's a good chance that maybe there was some sort of head injury. What kind of stuff clinically should we should be looking out for? Uh, sleep disorders is a pretty big deal with that. A previous history of anxiety and depression are highly associated with worse outcomes, cervical spine issues. So especially if you do something, if you, during your clinical exam, if you do something called the flexion rotation test, where you just maximally flex the person's head, have them turn to the right or left, it's pretty sensitive for cranial cervical type injuries. So brain fog, so any form of cognitive deficiency compared to where they were at baseline. And then you have your classic post-concussion symptoms or people with persistent headaches, dizziness, and those types of things are very, very highly responsive to chiropractic in many, many cases. So those are the big ones that I'll usually tease out early on in someone's history. Awesome. So you said anxiety and depression. So yes. previous history of anxiety and depression makes them more likely to have long-standing effects of concussion. Is that what you were saying, just to clarify? Yes. Okay. Yes. So previous history of anxiety and depression is a big factor in people ultimately developing post-concussion syndrome where their concussion symptoms will last beyond, you know, 
30 days or so. Okay. Okay. So like concussion syndromes normally last two weeks, 30 days. And beyond that, we go into like, all right, this is starting to become longstanding effects. What's our time frame there? Or what are we looking for? So there's debate about this in the literature, but for the most part, people accept that once you have symptoms beyond 30 days, they're probably going to classify you as having persistent post-concussion symptoms. Um, some people will put down 14 days, but 30 days seems to be the definitive marker for, for most people as far as what they're saying in the, the peer review literature. Awesome. It makes me so happy when I talk to a chiropractor and they say something like there's debate in the literature. It just, you know, <laughs> it makes my heart flutter a little bit. That's awesome. <laughs> How about chiropractically? Just with, uh, we mentioned anxiety and depression can be a marker for something that would cause them to have longstanding effects. Um, what about things like cervical curve? It, it, have you seen any research that shows, hey, if you're what we might call subluxation, obviously they're not going to use that term, but let's say you have a loss of curve, you have a head injury, you're more likely to have those long-standing effects. Have you seen anything like that? I haven't seen too much in that realm, but I like some of the stuff that some of the CBT guys are oh, publishing yeah. about decreased cervical blood or decreased uh, cranial cervical blood flow when people have decreased cervical curves. There's some guys that are doing some interesting work in strength and conditioning that are predicting that people with decreased cervical curves are a little bit more likely to suffer a cervical spine injury from a direct head-to-head impact, but nothing's quite published yet. But I think it can make a pretty interesting case that if you have a decreased cervical curve, that when you take a head-to-head impact in the style that football players do take, that you're exposing your neck to more shear forces than someone with a healthier neck curve. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, I think you, I don't know if I saw it on my own or if it came from your mailing list, but there was an article a while back that was looking at relating like speed of um, injuries and whiplash to like NFL injuries, essentially. And what they had found was that any head rotation during impact like significantly brought up the risk of having like shearing forces on the neck. Did that come from you or? Yeah, we did a, um, we did one of our research reviews about this and it involved motor vehicle impacts. So if someone got a rear end collision, if their head was forward, then it was more likely that we're going to suffer most primarily a whiplash. But if someone got on impact, had their head rotated, then the force that is instilled from the flexion and the head rotation produce really similar rates of concussion as you would have in people playing football. So one of the things that people have pointed out using accelerometer data from um, sensors implanted in helmets is that your average head injury was taking on anywhere about 96 Gs of force, whereas it takes about 4.6 Gs of force to induce a whiplash. So although whiplash and subluxation aren't the same things, right? You could kind of make these comparisons that if you suffer a whiplash, you're going to have a cervical subluxation type injury. So if you have a concussion, which is on average taking about 96 Gs of force, you're almost certainly going to have some type of whiplash force going into the neck, and which means that you're almost certainly going to have some type of cervical subluxation issue that's also happening in the neck at the same time. All right. Awesome. So early intervention. I think that's something that we should all, if we're going to be seeing these cases, which if you're a chiropractor, chances are, right? You said, you know, you're going to have somebody who comes in with a hip pain and it turns out they have some sort of post-concussive syndrome and they sort of see change with it. If we, if we suspect this sort of thing let's say, or, or, or whatever it is, or they went to the hospital, they, they, you know, hey, you most likely had this and then well, they weren't given anything other than medications and rest. And this comes into our office. What would you consider what in the literature is considered to be early intervention for these types of cases? So there's a really impressive evidence base showing up now that getting kids out of the rest mode after the first two days and doing something called sub-symptom threshold exercise within three days after concussion actually improves outcomes and prevents people from going into post-concussion syndrome or persistent post-concussion issues. So that's one of the things that um, the evidence base for that is becoming pretty definitive where we used to think, all right, let's just rest you until your symptoms went away. Now they're saying, hey, even if you have symptoms, let's actually have you be more active. Let's have you either walk, stationary bike, pedal, and get your heart rate up and see where your heart rate is that causes your symptoms to start to pop up. 
And once we know where your symptoms pop up with that exercise, then let's dial it back and have you exercise at this sub-symptom threshold heart rate and get your body to and your brain prepared to accept blood flow. So this is addressing some of the aspects of autonomic failure after concussion. And then after that, once the person's brain is starting to recover a little bit, I usually say getting interventions like uh, cervical spine care through chiropractic and vestibular therapy and things of those nature, that those lines is probably good to start to intervene with that within, you know, 10 days to 14 days after the head injury. So let the brain recover because sometimes, especially depending on your style of adjustment, getting a high velocity adjustment in the person's brain while they're still going through this metabolic crisis isn't that great. So once it recovers from that metabolic crisis, then you can start to address the aspects of subluxation and cervical spine injury that have happened from that type of uh, head injury. And then that's usually the window that I will go into when people are consulting me about having a head injury. And then, so obviously, so if you're using, in, in the case today, I think in your practice, um, I don't know if it's solely or mostly NUCA, which is very gentle, low, amp, low, what we, it's not HVLA, right? It's, what, would yeah. be, what would be considered? We call it low force, Leo, low amplitude. So some of the orthospinology guys have called it upper cervical low force technique. I like it. That works. So let's talk about, because we love, you know, we love subluxation and we love chiropractic and adjustments. And when we look at it, if we look at something like disaffrontation, right? We have the aberrancy of going up and then we can have dysautonomic issues coming back down. And one thing that you and I have spoken about is that when you, a lot of these cases that you see, you're seeing a lot of dysautonomia happening and even seeing change with that. So let's kind of put this connection here between concussion, chiropractic, dysautonomia, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. So that's one of the exciting things that we're really starting to look at in the Upper Cervical Research Foundation is the impact that the venous drainage of the neck can have on the autonomic nervous system. So it goes back to a theory that actually took, goes into some con controversial theories that evolved through MS called cerebral spinal venous insufficiency. And what that means is when there is a blockage in some of the veins that are draining the brain of blood, then there's reflux and backflow and back pressure up into the brain, which can cause problems with CSF drainage. And when you have problems with CSF drainage, then you could have lingering, persistent low-grade inflammation that's happening at the level of the brain. So there's been some studies done by a doctor named Michael Arada that showed that if he was able to open up some of the jugular veins with a balloon inside the jugular veins, that he could actually calm down the dysautonomia symptoms in patients with MS. So we're like, oh, that's cool. So that means that there's a possibility that this backflow of venous drainage could possibly be related to symptoms of dysautonomia in patients with, in, with MS. Now, when we look at some of these MRI studies that have been done on concussed patients, there's some studies that have shown that when patients have a concussion, even if they're asymptomatic, they'll have venous drainage problems as confirmed by MRI. So we know that patients with a concussion have bigger issues with venous drainage issues, problems. And we know that there's starting to be a relationship between rotation of the atlas and the possibility that rotation of the atlas can occlude or compress these jugular veins. Then you have a potential mechanism for how a cervical spine injury from something like a concussion can affect the jugular veins, create this back pressure, and possibly be a contributor to these symptoms of dysautonomia. And that's what we're seeing with a growing number of people are having things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, orthostatic intolerance, uh, syncope issues. And a lot of that goes back to if we can help the brain drain a little bit more effectively, then that probably helps with vagal tone, which we'll measure and see um, with heart rate variability responses. And on top of that, we just see that a lot of patients that we're able to take care of, even with just NUCA, show some signs of improvement and improvements in orthostatic intolerance and with POTS because we'll have probably a little bit later this year, um, working on a case study on a patient with uh, pretty profound POTS and their results after one upper cervical adjustment. So there is a potential mechanism there that the Upper Cervical Research Foundation is really interested in studying. So now we just got to 
you know, put the dollars together and go get the work done. Yeah, that's the uh, that that's the hard part, right? Yeah, put the dollars together and getting the work done. This sounds a lot like, and I think you mentioned some probably more up to date studies. But one of my favorite studies to talk about is the one with Scott Rosa and Demadian. Yeah, um, which is looking at upper MRI and like, I think one of the more like first studies in using MRI and looking at that venous drainage and where cervical spinal fluid flow and seeing restrictions there and aberrancies with upper cervical complex. Yeah, that's like that's one of the big foundations that kicked a lot of this stuff off. And you know, Michael Flanagan, he recently passed away, but he was a chiropractor that was really writing quite a bit about this topic. So if you you know go look at some of his papers, he talks about the hemodynamic and hydrodynamic influences that abnormalities at the cranial cervical junction can have on cerebral spinal fluid flow and venous jugular outflow too. That's that's that's, that's you said Michael Flanagan was the name. Yep, Michael. Probably Pratt. read some of his stuff. I just haven't really put the look for that author, and I have to pay attention and look at, at at the author there. Yeah, so he has a pretty interesting paper about it. It was published probably in 2016 before he passed away, but he goes into the mechanisms pretty extensively in his book. But his paper pretty much covers all the highlights where he, he talks about how these abnormalities are probably a prime mechanism for what's triggering people to develop. Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and multiple sclerosis. That's awesome. I'm definitely going to check that out. I'm going to look for his book as well. Thank you. One thing you mentioned was vagal tone when we were yes. going through. And that's such a big like thing right now in the research, right? Because we can look at vagal tone, we can look at HRV, we can look at all this different stuff that's huge. Because I, th- I would consider you just be super on point of mechanism and literature and stuff like that. The concept of the vagus passes right by the atlas, so a misalignment of the atlas can restrict or put pressure on the vagus nerve and cause it for its issues in vagal tone, um, which is kind of how like we educate. Sometimes people say, do you think that mechanism needs to be updated or are we good the way that is? I think it does need to be updated because it's, especially with the amount of uh, the magnitude of the subluxations that we measure radiographically, like the odds of it actually irritating, compressing the vagus nerve directly is probably slight for most patients. Not to say that it's impossible to happen because certainly a large enough rotation vector or a large enough translation vector could probably influence that. But I think we have to look a little bit deeper in the how the cranial cervical afferents influence the brainstem and how that could lead to vagus dysfunction. I think the ability for the atlas to possibly compress the jugular veins has a little bit of a stronger merit to it because there are actual studies done on patients uh, that show that if you have a compression of the jugular veins, it can be triggered by the atlas vertebra and it predisposes some people to cerebellar hemorrhage. So there's already a paper that says, hey, this is a physiologic mechanism that causes you know, serious problems in the brain. So there's stuff that we can build on and work on there where there's not as much where the direct compression of the vagus nerve is happening unless you have something like a tumor or something that's growing in that space. Yeah. And I think this is important because if you have a patient of yours, are we going to go through a conversation like that about how it could affect vagal tone, right? Like probably, probably not. It's really easy yeah. to keep it stable. Yeah. Absolutely. But however... It's really important for us to actually understand and, and, and know, because even if we just have that certainty within us, right, and it's for real, and if you do get, I mean, not in the off chance you get challenged by somebody who happens to know this, I mean, well, let's, let's throw out like the one in a thousand case, right? But if we really, each of us know within us, that just strengthens us as a profession. It strengthens us as, a, as, as the, we'll say, the principled movement or people who actually believe that chiropractic is beyond back pain. Right. It just it just makes us stronger. So I really appreciate people like you bringing this stuff to uh, to to light and working on it. Yeah. And a lot of these things can be simplified and still have elements of truth into it. Right. So I don't talk about direct compression in the vagus nerve like, you know, and people with people I educate people like, hey, you have this really elaborate plumbing system inside of your neck. And whenever you have these subtle misalignments, it can affect this plumbing system, which could cause pressure of things like fluid inside of your brain. It could affect blood flow inside of your brain. And if we just open it up, then your brain is getting more normalized, efficient circulation, which is going to help your brain work better overall, which is going to help your neck 
just function a lot better overall. And if your neck's functioning better, then that's also going to have a positive impact on how your brain functions too. So we can still take complex concepts and find analogies that are truthful and are, you know, that do maintain our integrity and our belief in what we know scientifically now. So we don't have to jump to these things where, you know, it's important in this age where people can Google anything that you say that you say something that isn't going to be easily debunked or easily presented to another doctor that can prove you this um, very easily. So I had this one case where, you know, we had a patient that was talking about, they went to a chiropractor and they said, you know, the atlas was crushing their brainstem. And she went to a neurologist and the neurologist basically, you know, raised their eyebrow and showed them an MRI and says, here's your brainstem, this is the atlas vertebrae. Like this atlas isn't crushing that. So that's not really true. So we have to make sure that we're saying things that can't be easily dismissed because it's beyond the realm of being physiologically possible, if that makes sense. Right. And it's beyond your practice, right? So it's like if you say that to 10 people and nine just go along with you, you make you have nine practice members. That's awesome. That's really important. Yeah. But that one now talks to a neurologist who now thinks that you and all chiropractors have no idea what they're talking about. And then it ends up digging us deeper in a hole. So while you have made more money in your pocket right now from saying that and keeping it super simple, like you need to understand these concepts. I think that's really important. Yeah. And if you ever just spend time in like a Facebook support group nowadays, like people are sharing everything that people say, their doctors say. And a lot of these people can say things that are really off the wall and are really crazy. But a lot of these people are getting that information from somewhere and they're having other, they're having serious discussions about this. So anything that we say now has the potential to be under a microscope. So the more that we can enhance our understanding of things and say things that have stronger elements of truth to it, I think the better. Which is good. And I think this microscope is good because it holds everybody accountable, right? And not just our profession, but it holds everybody accountable. And people are told what to do and and just doing it, right? They want information. They want to know. They want to have decisions. They want to have autonomy. And we did, I actually had in a case like this yesterday with a patient that just came in for a consult and her orthopedist said, and this is a woman that's like 40 years old. She has a slight hyperkyphosis in her spine and her orthopedic surgeon said, you know, you have the spine of an 80 year old and you need to, you know, really resolve this issue. And like, when you look at her spine, like, yeah, there's this hyperkyphosis there, but the discs are intact. There's no real strong signs of arthritis or anything like that. So this person is using some of the same communication strategies that have gotten us in trouble. And, you know, it's one of those things where you just have a conversation with them. It's like, hey, you have something called a thoracic hyperkyphosis. Yes, it's something that you want to get better, but you might have had this from a little bit of a genetic predisposition because when you look at it, like your discs are actually okay. You're not showing any excessive bone spurring or anything um, any signs of these ex- this excessive wear and tear. So there's a good chance that you might have just had this for a long time and you don't have the spine of an 80-year-old. You have the spine of a 55-year-old that probably could use some good chiropractic care to make your spine work a little bit more efficiently because you have this issue that was probably born with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a 55-year-old could probably use some chiropractic care. That's awesome. That's important to know. Well, uh, I... I I've, I've learned a lot from you this morning. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for being on. And I was burning up some notes earlier and I'm looking forward to going back and listening and mm-hmm. uh, reading some of these articles and some of this research. I just kind of wanted to ask you if there's anything, anything else that you kind of wanted to share, get into anything like that before we have to let you go to go see your, to see your patients this morning. I don't get anything I thought left off the top of my head, but I write and put a lot of my ramblings down on protecttheneck.com. So if you want to check that out and, you know, I post a lot of interesting stuff um, or at least people find it interesting and try to keep that going on my social media pages. So if you ever want to just see what I'm writing about, see what I'm thinking about, just follow those pages and, um, anyone that ever wants to ch- chat with me about those things, I'm happy to chat with them. Yeah, well, you know, you should uh, be careful with that one because there's people like me that will actually randomly message you on Facebook at 3 o'clock in the morning and ask for your opinion on cases and stuff like that. So <laughs> there's other people like that on here. So be careful with that. You might have an influx of messages. All well, good. Dr. Dr. Chung, I appreciate you being on here with me this morning. I got to learn a bunch. I hope all of you guys got to learn a bunch. 
Um, make sure you guys jump on that protectthenack.com mailing list because the info that you'll get is like huge and clinical and just really give you a really, really good understanding of what else to look at. Um, and then obviously, as you guys know, uh, I love taking this information and putting it into a chiropractic newsletter format. So you guys can check out chiropractic.com for that. Well, Doc, you're going to go change some lives today, slay some supplications? Yeah, for a half day, so. And then, uh, you know, get to uh, taking care of the baby girl and all of that. Cool. Well, I'm happy for you. And, uh, you know, I, I, w- I wish you the best. And I look forward to having you on here again soon, okay? Thanks, man. It was fun. Right. Bye, Doc.